let's go through the process of how a bill becomes a law. The Constitution actually states that for a bill to become a law, it must pass through both houses of Congress with a majority vote and then be, to be signed by the President. But it's a little bit more complicated. Let's start with looking up at the makeup of Congress. The Senate today has more Democrats than they do Republicans. So we say that the Democrats have the majority in the Senate. The House is the opposite. The Republicans have more members than the Democrats do, so they have a majority. That becomes important when we get to committee. We'll talk about that here in a minute. A bill can start in either house. It really doesn't matter which one it begins in. However, revenue bills must start in the House of Representatives. That's the only exception. And a revenue bill is a tax bill. After a bill is started, it is then referred to committee. Now, each house has a number of committees. And those committees um, deal with bills that, that are related to them. So the Senate has a committee. These are the Senate committees on agriculture, nutrition, and forest, and appropriations, on armed services, and so on. And these committees will work on the bill. Now, let's take a look at some committees. Let's look at the Agricultural Committee in the Senate. Because I want to point out a couple things. If we look at the membership in here, we notice that on the left here, these are the Democrats. Right, these two columns here are the Republicans. And you notice that there are more Democrats in this committee than there are Republicans. That's because the Democrats have a majority in the Senate. And because they have a majority in the Senate, they will have a majority of members in every single committee. And their chairperson, in this case, Debbie Stabenow, is always going to be a Democrat. So the advantage of, of having a majority in a House is that you get to have a majority in every single committee is where a lot of work gets done. And you also get to have a major uh, the, the uh, committee chairperson, which is important too. This is the House. These are the House committees. Now let's look at, let's just do the Appropriations Committee here. Um, let's see if I can find its members. Notice the Republicans are over here, Democrats over here. There are more Republicans than the chairperson Republicans. Again, simply because the Republicans have a majority in the House. Any committee we look at in the House today is going to have more Republicans. Any committee we look at in the Senate today is going to have more Democrats. After a bill is referred to the committee, the committee can do a few things. One of the things they'll do is hold hearings. Now, a hearing is outside experts that are not members of Congress come in and testify before Congress in separate rooms. It's not on the floors of Congress, but uh, in committee rooms. And they'll testify and explain <clears throat> and answer questions about this particular piece of legislation or how it will affect uh, society or, or their particular business or whatever. The goal is for the, the members of Congress to become more informed about the issues that this bill will create. They can also change the bill. After the hearings are made, the committee can make any changes they want to the bill. They can add things to it. They can delete things off of it. And to make a change, it takes a simple majority vote. So again, if it is a Democratic bill and we're in the Senate, there's a good chance that they can change it as they want. Uh, Republicans may have a difficult time getting what they want into the bill, and vice versa goes in the House. When it comes to voting on the bill, after the, all the changes are done, the committee can vote on the bill. And if a majority want to pass that bill, then it moves to the next stage. They can't get a majority of support. That bill basically dies at the committee level. It doesn't go any farther. And that's what happens with most of The committees do most of the work on the bill. If a committee gets out of the bill, uh, if a bill gets out of the committee, excuse me, it goes to the floor. The floor is the, the full floor of the House or the full floor of the Senate. So in our example, let's say we have a Senate bill. It's gone through a Senate committee and it's made it out. Now it goes to the full floor where they can debate the bill is just basically argue the merits of the bill. They can make whatever changes they want to the bill. And again, a simple majority is needed to make any changes to the bill. The bill can change a great deal. And lastly, they can vote on the bill. And if the bill gets a majority of support, then the bill is passed. If it doesn't, then the bill dies. Now, this bill then, if it passes, in this case, let's say the Senate, then it goes to the House where the same steps are going to apply. And we'll get to that in a second. But first of all, the Senate has a rule that is a little bit different than a House rule, and that is known as the filibuster. 
This is only allowed in the Senate. And the House does not allow it. And what essentially a filibuster is, is preventing a bill from being voted on. Now, let me give you the traditional way of how it was done in the past, and then I'll tell you how it's done today. But traditionally, let's say that 55 senators are in favor of a bill and 45 are opposed. Well, this bill is going to pass. But those 45 don't want it to pass, so they want to deny it a chance to be voted on. So they talk on the bill, and they debate the bill endlessly because the Senate allows endless debate on a bill. They can't vote on a bill until everyone has had a chance to debate it and as long as they want. That those 45 feel like they can just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk on that particular bill with hopes that eventually those in the majority will say, the heck with it, you guys win. Let's just put this on a shelf and move on and work with other stuff. Uh, it's a way of preventing a vote on a bill, which essentially kills a bill. It wasn't used very much because, first of all, it's hard to talk forever. I mean, if you're in the majority, you can just wait the other side out. Um, so you got to have a lot of people. You can't have three people filibustering a bill. They say it won't be successful to filibuster it for long. But if you have 45, maybe you could do it. We don't have to do that anymore, though. The Senate changed the rules to make it, I guess, easier to filibuster. Uh, today in the Senate, all you have to do is declare a filibuster. And if a bill is declared to be filibustered, then there's no vote taken on that particular bill. It's taken the work out of it. Now, there is a rule called the cloture that if 60 senators vote to end the filibuster, it's called a cloture vote, the filibuster ends. So what this really means is that in order for a bill to, to pass through the Senate, even though the Constitution says a majority vote, in reality, if you don't have 60 senators on your side, there's a very good chance it's not going to pass. So it really almost takes 60 votes to get anything passed through the Senate, rather than the simple majority of 51. All that is because of the filibuster. Now, there have been some changes in the filibuster rule as of 2013. You can still filibuster bills and Supreme Court nominations. However, now remember that the Senate also has to confirm Supreme Court job nominations and other uh, federal judges along with executive offices. They can still filibuster Supreme Court nominees and bills. However, they can't filibuster other presidential nominations, uh, which would include lower court judges, like circuit court judges, and so on. This is a change, um, but the filibuster still exists. And the filibuster is used quite a bit. You can see here that back when it was a traditional filibuster, not very often. Now that it's no longer a traditional filibuster, all you have to do is declare it. We see that filibusters are much more common than they had been in the past. Again, filibusters are only used in the Senate. This is one of the traditional ones. Strom Thurmond holds a record of speaking over 24 hours on a particular bill. Uh, we don't see this kind of filibuster often anymore. We've seen a couple in Congress the last couple of years, but really they've been ineffective. After a bill passes through the first house, it goes to the second house. And in the second house, the exact same steps apply as the first house. Some procedural differences, but in our example, it started in the, the Senate with the committee and then the floor. Now it goes to the House, it goes to the committee in the House. If it makes it through there, then it goes to the floor. Again, majority vote. If it makes it through the floor, then it doesn't go to the president yet. It goes to the conference committee. Conference committee is made up of members of both houses to try to come up with a version of the bill that they think both houses can agree with. Remember, the bill may have changed in the second house. If the bill changed in the second house, then the first house didn't pass that exact same version of it. So they have to get together and try to come up with a version of the bill that both parties or both houses can agree with. And after they come up with whatever kind of version of that bill they can come up with, then it goes back to the floor vote again. Now it goes to both houses separately. Uh, both houses got to pass the exact same bill. And they can debate the bill. And they can vote on the bill. They can't make any changes at this time. So this, this is just one more step. If it makes it through the floor vote a second time, now both, part, both houses have voted on the exact same bill. So if it passed this with the majority vote, off it goes to the president. Or the president can sign the bill. And if he does so, it becomes law.
or the president can veto the bill. If the president vetoes the bill, he's rejecting it. Now, that doesn't necessarily kill the bill because the Constitution allows Congress to override a presidential veto. That means that if the bill then is voted on again by Congress, and if both houses of Congress, both the House and the Senate, separately pass the bill with a two-thirds vote, that bill becomes law, even though the president vetoed the bill. It's known as overriding a veto. It doesn't happen very often, but it is. it does happen some. And I'll show you some statistics in a minute. The other option the president has is to do nothing. The Constitution says if the president does nothing, the bill becomes law after 10 days, unless Congress is not in session. And if Congress has adjourned for whatever reason, then the bill dies for 10 days. So again, if the president does nothing, it either becomes law or dies, depending on if Congress is in session or not. That is known as a pocket veto if, if the bill dies because Congress is not in session and the president doesn't take any action. Let's take a look at a list of presidential vetoes here. You will notice when this pulls up that very few vetoes are actually overridden. We're locking up here. But I believe the total number is 4% of all presidential vetoes are overridden, which means that if the president vetoes a bill, that pretty much means that that veto is going to stand. Sorry about this. There we go. Um, list of vetoes right here. You notice that there's 2,600 or 564 total vetoes in American history. 110 have been overwritten. Doesn't happen much. This is a list of them. Um, President Obama has only vetoed two according to this. I think that is correct. Uh, I know George Bush's 12 vetoes is correct. 33% had been overridden. Um, this shows the pocket vetoes here. This is a regular veto. The presidential veto power is actually a pretty big power that they have because so few of those vetoes are overridden. The last thing I want to go over is sorry about that. I want to quickly talk about this. Sometimes we elect members of Congress, so maybe we think, hey, they can vote however they want. And I guess they can, but they have a lot of pressure on them. They have pressure by interest groups and lobbying, uh, PACs, groups that we've talked about before. Their constituents, the people that voted them in the office, their state uh, are probably putting pressure on them or maybe putting pressure on them to vote a certain way on a particular issue. Their party, maybe, or even the President of the United States. There's a lot of people that are trying to say, hey, vote this particular way for whatever reason. So members of Congress don't just get to vote however they want. I guess they can, but the reality of it is, is there's usually some other groups that are trying to convince them to vote a certain way, for whatever reason. And that's part of our democratic system. Ah, hopefully that better explains how a bill becomes a law.